All right, let's turn in our Bibles. I'm glad I found mine. I got through the rain this afternoon. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. We've been studying the names of Jesus in the Bible. And we'll have to begin our examination of this next one. Way back in Exodus, the 16th chapter, we sang this evening, Bread of Heaven. Bread of Heaven, feed me till I want no more. Jesus Christ is that bread. He's the bread of God. The Bible says in Exodus 16, Now, the children of Israel came out of Egypt. Passover night is Exodus 12. The Red Sea crossing is Exodus 15. In Exodus 16, the Bible says in verse number 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people should go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it should come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it should be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, And even then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning then shall ye see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. What are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Now, Father, we ask and pray that you'd bless your word to our hearts tonight and minister to us truth about your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Now, here's, here's just one of those, one more undeniable proof, uh, first of all, of how degenerate human nature is. And second of all, how faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not by the sight of the eyes and not by beholding miracles. The children of Israel saw the ten plagues that God wrought upon Egypt. The children of Israel saw their deliverance through the blood of the Lamb on Passover night. The children of Israel have just walked through the Red Sea as as on dry land. And they are standing on the deliverance side of the Red Sea. And Moses says, all right, maybe if God sends food down out of heaven, you'll believe him. Now, how could you not believe him after those nine plagues fell upon Egypt? How could you not believe him after the destruction and deliverance on Passover night? How could you not believe him after walking through the water walls on either side of that Red Sea and landed safe on the other side and watching Pharaoh's army drown in that ocean? After all that, the Bible said in Exodus 16, 1, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots... And when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Amazing. For for 430 years, they've been under the lash in Egypt. They have been bond slaves to Pharaoh in his building projects. And they're not out of that bondage for, for, uh, for a week, when they're looking back upon it as though it were a place where we just sat around and dipped our hands in the flesh pots and did nothing but eat and drink and rise up to play. Isn't that incredible? And, and they're murmuring, not against God, they wouldn't dare do that. They're murmuring against the pastor and the assistant pastor of the congregation for why did you bring us here when we had it so good over there? 
Amazing. Now, here's, here's the first thing that, that I need to understand from this passage, and I believe everyone else needs to understand from this passage. You know why they said that? Because the Bible says they were hungry. Fasting is never commanded in the Bible. But Jesus said, when I'm taken away, my disciples will fast. And I, I've searched the Bible. I don't see any guaranteed answered prayers if you fast. I don't see necessarily any guaranteed spiritual growth if you fast. But I'll tell you one thing. It'll convince you of how much your flesh controls and dominates your life. And how it doesn't matter if there's a God in heaven or a Holy Ghost inside you. Or if you have eternal life. You just go maybe six hours without eating. And all you can think about is how much you want something to eat. And you say, well, I'll just fast and pray. Uh, you'll probably just fast. Because you get down on your knees and, dear God, I pray that you'd bless uh, the pantry and I pray you'd bless the refrigerator and how much longer did I say I was going to fast for? And I'm just telling you, when Philippians says their God is their belly... It's only in our best days that that's not true of every one of us. And you just watch your disposition change when you're hungry. You watch your personality transform when you're hungry. You watch smile turn to grouch if supper's 30 minutes past your growling point. So here are the children of Israel, and you'd think they'd be sitting around marveling at the hail that fell and at the moraine that lashed out at the cattle and at the waters turning to blood and, and rejoicing that all their firstborn are with them and none of them were slain on Passover night and being amazed at what it was like to go through that experience there at, at Sea World Egypt where they, where they came through that Red Sea and saw all of that. And, but they're not because there's no supper. And in their minds, being a slave with supper is better than being free and not knowing what we're going to eat for breakfast. When the Bible says, we read it Thursday night, what is man that thou art mindful of him? I'll tell you what he is. He's capable of being spiritual as long as the flesh is provided for but as soon as that flesh begins to be in want, spiritual goes right out the window and flesh kicks right back in. Now, I wish that wasn't true, but if you could show me anything from Genesis to Revelation to prove otherwise, then I'll, I'll back down. But uh, having read the Bible start to finish, I don't see one place in there that gives me any ground to put confidence in my flesh. Now, watch what the Lord says. He didn't say... I'm going to send bread from heaven morning and night because these people are hungry. Did you read it carefully? Look what he says. Verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, comma, and the people should go out and gather a certain rate every day. The Lord said, Moses, I'm going to feed them so they'll get off your back. You see that? He told Moses, I'm going to send that bread for you. And they will go out and have something to eat. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Now the Lord, He feeds us, praise the Lord. And He puts clothes on our back, hallelujah. And He puts a roof over our head, thanks be to God. But while it's true He does that because He loves us, and He does that because He's gracious... Don't you think it's also true he does that so he doesn't have to listen to us all day long? It's like the only way I can get any rest is if I provide for their temporal needs. Because if I don't, here they come running up to me whining about how, oh God, you got to do this and oh God, you got to do that. And if, if their soul lacks humility or their soul lacks grace or their soul lacks patience or their soul lacks compassion, I never hear a word from them. 
But if their body lacks food or drink or comfort or, or a, a nice experience, man, they're right here in the prayer meeting. We're going to get to the Jesus part. Just come on, it's been two months. We've got to work a little, a little something in here about our condition. So, now notice also what he says, and this, this is important. He said that he gave them flesh to eat, verse 8. I shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, in the morning bread to the full. It's interesting that in this first passage, the bread and the flesh are used interchangeably. What you eat that sustains your flesh is called flesh. Okay, because it was it was bread in the morning, it was bread in the evening. Now, here's what's interesting. It's not called manna by God. It's called manna by the people. And the people called it manna, meaning, what is it? God called it bread. So they looked at God's provision, which was bread, but they looked at it without knowledge and without understanding, and they called it, what is it? Which is very interesting. Because in the New Testament, when the bread of God comes down from heaven, men look at it and say, what is it? Who art thou? Who are you? Are you the prophet? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Are you Jeremiah? Are you, are you, well, who are you? Are you John the Baptist risen from the dead? They looked at the bread of life the same way the children of Israel looked at the bread that came down morning and night from God in the wilderness. They didn't recognize it for what it was. Later they would say, take a look, in Numbers chapter 11, Numbers chapter 11, they ate it every morning. They ate it every night. On Friday, the scripture said, they gathered a double portion and they kept it so that on the next day, the Sabbath day, they could eat that. They wouldn't have to go out and, and gather any food or prepare any meals because that was the Sabbath. Some people in your town call themselves Sabbath keepers, but they don't keep the Sabbath. They don't prepare enough meals on Friday to get them through Saturday. Because you're not supposed to light a fire, you're not supposed to cook food, you're not supposed to do any labor on the Sabbath day. They'll go to church on Saturday and say, we meet on the, on the right day of the week, and then they'll go out to the restaurant. Then they'll go in the back and have a barbecue. So that's, that's not Sabbath keeping. Anyway, so they eat that every morning, every night. And the Bible says in Numbers chapter 11... And verse number 6, no, verse 5, and 4, 4, 4, verse 4, Exodus, uh, Numbers, here we go, Numbers 11, 4. Ready? Numbers 11, 4. You think it's bad listening, you should have been my translator. Numbers 11, 4. And the mixed multitude, don't you like that mixed there? You say, shouldn't it be M-I-X-E-D? No, it should be. M-I-X-T. Either one will do. Well, I can't understand it. Yes, you can understand it. The mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. Freely? They're throwing your babies in the river. They're murdering your children. They're commanding you make bricks without straw and putting a lash to your back. What do you mean freely? Now, stay with it. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Now, I like, I like fish. I like melons. But leeks and onion and garlic and cucumber... That sounds like something an American eats when he's in a foreign country and can't get meat. And that's what they said. They said, we remember. But now, verse 6, our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Well, there's nothing except what God gave us. And the manna was as coriander seed. The color thereof is the color of bedellium. So that clears that up for you. 
And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and, or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. And Moses heard the people weep throughout their families. They're crying. Oh, we got this manna. We're sick of this stuff. Okay, now, no, wait a minute. You know what happens on a regular basis in every Christian church in this world? People whose very life comes from Jesus Christ get tired of just having Jesus Christ. And they so miss Egypt. And they so miss the world. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, I guess it's okay to be saved, but I just, I, I miss the movies. I, 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 miss, I miss drinking. I don't see what's wrong with drinking. I'm just Jesus all the time. Jesus, Jesus. I mean, it's got to be more than Jesus. The blessings of God poured out upon them every single day of their life, but they get tired of just this God stuff. They get bored with just this Jesus. They miss the way they used to dress when they were lost. They miss the language they used to use when they were lost. They miss the songs they used to put on the, the music player when they were lost. And it's just, oh, it's church again. Oh, it's the Bible again. Oh, it's prayer meeting again. Oh, it, well, what do you do for fun? Well, we serve the Lord. No, I mean for fun. It's fun to serve the Lord. Well, no, I mean, we, we miss Egypt. It was so much better in Egypt. It wasn't the night you repented. It wasn't all those months and years you were testifying about how glad you are you got saved. It wasn't when you were throwing your arms around Christians in the doorhouse of the church and saying, Man, I'm glad I got this crowd now and not the old crowd. But somewhere along the way, between bondage in Egypt and the promised land, they got tired of God's daily blessing and got to missing that old world. Remember when you first got saved? You still read the Bible like you did then? Or have you brought some leeks and onions back in? You still dress and act and fellowship like you used to back then? Or have you brought in some of those melons from back over there in Egypt? You still arrange your schedule so you never miss church? Or does church sometimes get in the way of those Egyptian fish? They're still on their way to the promised land. God's still sending down blessings every morning and every night. they just gotten tired of it. And they're sitting at home in their tents complaining about God's provision. Mm. Lord, search my heart and try me. May the Lord search every one of our hearts and try us. And see if we're as, as excited about the bread of God coming down from heaven today as we, as we once were. Amen. All right, so that's their condition. Now, look at Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter number 5. They are crossing Jordan and entering the promised land. Joshua 5, verse number 12. And the manna ceased. On the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. How about that? God provided for them every single day. He provided all they needed for life from the day they left bondage in Egypt until the day they set foot in the promised land, everything they needed was provided for them by God. Are you saved tonight? From the day you got saved until the day you set foot in the promised land, God will send from heaven everything you need every single day from now all the way to glory. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. All right, let's come to John chapter number 6. 
So that's the background. We've got to understand the, the bread falling down from heaven or we'll never understand the passage that we're about to read. John chapter number 6. John 6. And verse 27. Jesus said, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Praise the Lord. I'm saved by works. That one. If you do that work, you don't have to do the other works. So anybody says, well, I just believe you're saved by works. That's the verse to show them. That's the work that saves, believing on Jesus Christ. They said, therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, this is typical of man. What do they remember about the wilderness? They remember that God gave them bread from heaven. What have they conveniently forgotten? That the people did not appreciate it or enjoy it. Interesting. So, so what they're saying is, if you want to prove to us that you're worthy of believing, then what you just, we're in John 6, what has he just done? He's just fed 5,000 people with barley loaves and fishes. They have followed Jesus from that place to the next, and Jesus said, the only reason you followed me here is I gave you food. And now he says, I want you to believe on me. And they say, if you'll give us food every day, we'll believe on you. Now, how typical is that? Will you believe in Jesus Christ if all you get for believing in Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ? These boys and girls, these good news clubs, it break your heart to work with them. They come, the, the team comes in at school, teaches that Bible lesson, said, now if any of you want to want to know more about Jesus or want Jesus to be your Savior, come out and meet with somebody. And they go out, my wife or Linda or, or uh, Brother David or different ones, we'll talk with those boys and girls. And here's what they'll say, seven, eight, nine years old, ten years old, eleven years old. They'll say, if I ask Jesus to save me, will my mommy quit doing drugs? If I ask Jesus to save me, will that man that lives in our house quit beating my mommy? If I ask Jesus to save me, will we have food to eat for supper tomorrow? Listen, I'm not finding fault. What I'm saying is whether it's a 10-year-old boy or a 60-year-old man, this world is full of people who want God to fix their physical problems or the difficulties they have in their life. And they will follow a Jesus... As long as he's handing out material blessings. But what if all he has to offer you is himself? Do you still want him? What if you trust Jesus as your Savior and still lose your marriage? And still lose your health? And still lose your children? And don't get your job back? And none of your circumstances or situations improve in this life? Do you just want Jesus? Or do you want the things he has to offer? I, I, I'm not against, in this country and other countries, saying, we'll give you a slice of pizza if you'll come hear the gospel. But almost every one of those people is gone as soon as the pizza runs out. And they're looking for the next place where they're giving out pizza. When a missionary, well-intentioned, goes overseas and gives out clothes or medicine or food or money... They write home glowing reports until the container's empty. And when there's no more stuff to give out, the crowd dwindles back out in search of some other material thing. 
Christian radio in the 1960s and 1970s was full of men preaching Jesus. Today, Christian radio and TV is full of men preaching what Jesus can give you for your wallet, or give you for your body, or give you for your relationships. And the Lord said, uh, that's... Uh, so, so they said to the Lord, said, well, well, if you want us to believe on you, you're going to have to do at least what you did, what God did for our fathers in the wilderness. Give us free food every day. That's what, that's what they're asking. Verse uh, 31, our fathers did eat man in the desert. It is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. He just says, we're not discussing that. That was then, this is now. The Father gave, but right now He giveth. There is a true bread from heaven, and that wasn't it. Now look, it was truly bread from heaven, but it wasn't the true bread from heaven. How do you know? Verse number 33, For the bread of God is He. See that? It's a person. It's not a thing. For the bread of God is He which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. How about that? That bread for 40 years sustained for days or months or years the lives of men who would eventually die. But there is a bread sitting before those men in John 6 who could sustain them in such a way that they would never die. That's true bread. Keep reading. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Now that's the key to the passage. Now listen, because this is the most messed up passage of Scripture in all the Bible. So listen carefully. What happened in the wilderness? Again and again and again and again and again, the Father gave them bread. Jesus said, now the Father giveth you the true bread. It's He. It's a person. And they said, then give us this bread again and again and again and again and again. What did they ask for? Evermore. That is, on a continual basis, give us this bread. So you see what they want? They want a perpetual offering of the bread of God to sustain their life incrementally. Each time the children of Israel ate that bread, they stayed alive a little longer until they ate the bread again. So the people Jesus is speaking to, they look at him and say, Well, you give us bread now, and each time you give it to us, we'll live a little bit longer until we take that bread again. But verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. That's who he said he is. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Now, now, stop right there. When those children of Israel ate manna in the morning, you know why they needed manna again that night? Because they got hungry again. They needed another feeding of that bread from heaven. But Jesus said, the bread that's sitting before you, that's me. I am the bread of God come down from heaven. If you eat this bread one time, you will never have to eat it again because you'll never get hungry again. Now, that's hard for Americans to understand because we eat whether we're hungry or not. But, But the purpose of eating is to satisfy hunger. Now, if you went to a church this morning where they told you a piece of bread was Jesus and said that if you would eat that piece of bread, you'd have eternal life. 
At the end of that meeting, they would tell you to come back next Sunday and eat another piece of bread so you can get a little more eternal life. Right up until the day you die, when they would come to your deathbed and give you another piece of bread to keep you alive until we could start getting money from your kinfolk. Jesus said, this bread that the Father sent me, 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 this bread, it's not like that bread. That bread, you had to keep eating it because it could sustain you for just a little while. But me, the true bread, if you eat me once, you'll never need another bite of bread because I will give you everlasting life. You'll never hunger again. It's just, it just clear as it can be if you read the context. Now, look at verse number 37. Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So what do you have to do to have everlasting life? Believe on him. Once you've believed on him, you don't have to keep getting life again and again and again and again and again. When you believed on him, you got everlasting life. I'm hungry. I've got to eat. If I don't eat, I'm going to die. Well, thank God there's manna coming down first thing in the morning. And they go out and eat it. They march all day through the wilderness. The end of the day, I'm hungry. i got to have something to eat. And down comes manna, and they eat it again. And for 40 years, till they reached the promised land, God kept giving them bread because it was just enough to get them through half a day. That's all. But when your soul believes on Jesus Christ... That one meal is sufficient to keep you alive forever. Thanks be to God. So he says, verse number 41, Then the Jews murmured to him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Well, actually, you're wrong. You might know his mother, but you obviously don't know his father. You know Joseph, but you don't know his father. How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Murmur not among yourselves. <laughs> now look at this. In the Old Testament, God gave them bread from heaven. <clears throat> and what did they do? They murmured about it. In the New Testament, God gave them bread from heaven. And what did they do? They murmured about it. What did they have to do in the Old Testament to stay alive? They had to do works every single day. They had to go out and gather that bread and prepare that bread and eat that bread every single day to stay alive. And they murmured. They complained. We don't like it this way. So New Testament, God sends down bread, His Son, and says, Oh, you get it one time from your heart. No works. Just believe on me. And you'll never have to eat again. You'll, ne you'll never hunger again. And they murmured against that. God can't win. If He gave you law in the Old Testament, you wouldn't keep it. If He gave you grace in the New Testament, you, would, you wouldn't believe that. In the Old Testament, instead of working for salvation and keeping these laws, they said, well, God should just forgive us. In the New Testament, God says, I'll just forgive you. And everybody and his brother starts a religion telling you how to be saved by works. Men just don't want God's way. Whatever God says to do, they're just trying to do just the opposite. Just out of pride or spite, I don't know which it is. So they murmured. And, and Jesus said, verse 43... Uh, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. 
Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath yes. Amen. got it right now. Right now. Last week I was witnessing four uh, Mormons and they said, nobody can have eternal life right now. So I do. You can't have it because that book you're reading doesn't offer it. I can have it because the book I'm reading does offer it. You just got the wrong book. Jesus said, I am that bread of life. How many of you have trouble memorizing Scripture? Anybody? Let's memorize the verse right now tonight. Ready? I am that bread of life. See how easy it is? John six forty eight. Now, what, watch the difference. Your fathers did eat manna and the wilderness, in the wilderness and are dead. Even the bread that God sent down from heaven cannot provide you with an escape from death. Got that? Okay, so let's say this. I, I take every opportunity I can to say this because it constantly needs to be said to Bible-believing Christians. Christians who believe the Bible know the world's wrong. And so, therefore, just instinctively, what most, what the majority does, they say is wrong. And they figure, well, if we're against the majority, we must be right. But cars are convenient, and plumbing's nice, and air conditioning's nice, so we don't really preach against that, But even though the majority does. But anyway, if you ate, barring the forbidden fruit, if you could find out what Adam and Eve ate in the garden and eat it, you would still die. If you found out what Noah ate after the flood, so you could try and live 743 years or 820 years, why anybody would want to do that, I don't know. You would die. If you never eat Fritos, you're going to die. If you do eat Fritos, you're going to die. Okay? Whatever food you eat, whether it's a Bible diet or a non-Bible diet or an Old Testament diet or a New Testament diet or I read it on the Internet diet and this guy said he's still got great eyesight at 75, you're going to die. In the wilderness, the children of Israel ate no preservatives. They ate no red dye they ate no MSLRD number 47. All they ate was what God made in heaven and sent down for them every morning and every night, and none of them lived longer than 40 years. Because the wages of sin is death. And you're not going to beat that with or without Pop-Tarts. You're going to die. Now look, if every time I ate, ate um, I don't know, every time I ate a hamburger, I got a headache, I wouldn't eat a hamburger. But I wouldn't start a website and say hamburgers cause headaches because everybody else I know can eat a hamburger and not get a headache. Now there are a few things that are proven. Supersizing it will cause weight gain. All that means you're going to need a bigger casket. You're, I'm not trying to be harsh, but everybody's, everybody's looking for a way to avoid death, and there's only one. It's Jesus. You're not going to save your flesh. You can only save your soul. Now, if, if there's something you eat and it makes your kids hyper, then maybe you don't feed that to your kids. But you can go to the pharmacy and feed your kids stuff that keeps them from ever being hyper, but I don't know you want to feed them that either. When we were hyper, my dad didn't feed us. He, he did something else. <laughs> he didn't go to the front. He went to the back. <laughs> 
practice his tennis follow through. <laughs> okay, so anyway, your fathers did eat manna. Where'd that come from? Straight from God. God dropped it right out of heaven. And that's what they ate. And within four decades, they were all dead. Just let that, want that to sink in. This, verse 50, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. And not die. Last month, as, as fine a Christian as I, as I know, or as, as, as I've known, Barbara Baker, what a godly lady. And how she suffered without complaining. That woman died. Her body was placed in the ground. The ashes went back to ashes. The dust went back to dust. But one day in her life, she took Jesus Christ as her Savior. And that woman is more alive today than she was the last time you saw her sit in this church house. Because the bread she ate the day she trusted Jesus Christ gave her everlasting life for her soul, though there was nothing that could preserve her body because sin had gotten in it. On Wednesday we had the service for Mercedes Taylor. What a blessing she was to our church. And her, her bracelet making and her blanket making and sitting back in the back and crying about how she was blessed by the sermon. And y'all be sitting there dozing off and she'd be back in the back waving her hand and shaking her fist when I was preaching. She just loved the Lord. And her body, despite all that medical science could do, it died. Because sin was in it. But because one day she ate the bread of God that came down from heaven, she is more alive today than she was a week ago. Jesus is not offering you a pantry full of groceries. He's offering you everlasting life when you leave this body, which you must do. That's what we preach to the world. You know, we go out uh, 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 on the street, you know, almost every time we go out there, you know what somebody's saying? You ought to be feeding the hungry. We are. They just don't want to eat what God is offering them. We are absolutely feeding the hungry with that which will cure them and keep them from ever hungering again. Over in Moldova, and it's these social work, communist social workers, you know, they come up with their, one, one fellow, he had, he had, he's handing out Stalinist literature. Now, you know something? Before 70 years of communism, you might get people to buy into that. But after 70 years of prison camps and starvation, it's, it's pretty hard to sell communism to anybody under, under or, or, or over 18. But they'd come up to us, we'd be out there giving out those scriptures on the street, and they'd come up and say, if you want to really help these people, you'd, you'd set up some food kitchens. You'd set up some food banks. You know, they're the same people looking at Jesus and saying, we'll believe you if you'll fill our bellies. We'll believe you if you put groceries in our cabinet. Jesus said, we did that, and you didn't believe. For 40 years, he sent bread down out of the sky every morning and every night, six days a week, and double on Friday, and they didn't believe him. They died in the wilderness in unbelief. So miracles don't save anybody. Seeing miracles, experiencing miracles, that's not what it takes. you got to, from your heart, you got to put your faith and trust in the Lord. And Jesus said, if you do that one time. Now, look at verse number... 59. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. 
The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, hasn't he made it abundantly clear he's talking about something you eat one time and never need to eat again? Didn't you see? See, if they'd just read the Scripture, you know what the problem was? He said, You do err not knowing the Scripture. What did he say the bread was that came down from heaven? Come on, remember in Exodus? It was flesh. Right? It was bread. He called it flesh. That is, it sustained their flesh. He said, I'll give my flesh to the Lord. Jews, Jews murmured about that. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your father, look, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. For he did eat this bread shall live forever. Okay, question. This is not a this is not a hard question unless you're the Pope. Of course, I'm not sure about this Pope. Well, if you were a Catholic right now, wouldn't you be sweating it? In the last in the last month, this guy has said you don't have to believe in God to go to heaven. An atheist is just as valid as a Roman Catholic. And that we need to lighten up on abortion and homosexuality. Now, don't you know that college of cardinals running around saying, who nominated this guy? <laughs> Where would he come from? <laughs> when he promised them hope and change, they didn't really know what he meant, but they're, they're finding out. But anyway, how did they eat manna in the wilderness? Didn't they take it and put it in their mouth and chew it up and swallow it? Jesus just said, you don't eat me the way they ate manna. Know what he said? So he just said, you don't put me in your mouth and chew me up and swallow me. How does he live by the Father? He has perfect faith in his Father. The man Christ Jesus has perfect faith, un, un, unwavering trust in his Father. And he said, if you will live by me like I live by the Father, you'll have everlasting life. So we don't come once a week and put Jesus in our mouth and chew him and swallow him. We put our unwavering faith and trust in Him. And if you'll do that one time in your life, you'll never hunger again, you'll never die, you'll have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. He's the true bread that came down from heaven. He's the living bread that gives life to the world. And if you'll eat Him, not with your mouth, but with your heart... You'll never die. Not your body. Your soul. Never die. Now you can see why that passage was confused people. Because what happens is, is that they go to catechism. And the priest shows them the eating my flesh and drinking my blood part. He doesn't show them John chapter 6. He doesn't show them numbers. He doesn't show them Exodus. He gives them no context. He gives them no Bible whatsoever. He gives them a verse ripped out of the Bible and church tradition. Which is why when you ask somebody, are you saved? Well, I'm, I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Protestant, or I'm a this or that. Well, have you ever received Jesus as your Savior? Oh, many times. In fact, I'm on my way to do it again right now. That's because religion likes to take verses out of the Bible. God wants us to leave them in the Bible. And if you leave a verse in the Bible and read what's before it and what's behind it, it all fits together and you don't end up striving to get eternal life in a place where you can never get it. All right, so the Bible says in verse number 59, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. 
Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. He said to them, Does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the... Now look. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. If you could live in perfect health for 150 years, if you died without your soul being saved, it would profit you nothing to have enjoyed all of that good health for all those many years. And if you died at the age of 12, God forbid, of some cancer or some terrible disease, having trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you may not have gained the whole world, but you didn't lose your soul. You're absent from the body and present with the Lord. He's not talking about prolonging physical life. He's talking about everlasting spiritual life. And he goes on to say, the flesh profit of nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, there, he, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now, I'll say this carefully. I don't want to start a controversial argument. A disciple is a follower. Discipline. It's a disciplined follower. Jesus said to Peter, one of his disciples, he said, When you're converted, strengthen your brethren. There were many, many, many people who followed Jesus, but they never believed on him. They never trusted him. Because they kept taking his words to be physical when they were spiritual or, or spiritual when they were physical. They never seemed to be able to get it right. I, I will say this as kindly as I know how. In your town are Catholics and Protestants and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Adventists and Baptists who are disciples of Jesus. They are really trying to follow him. They go to mass more than some saved Baptists go to church. They, they do penance and they say prayers and they give offerings and, and they donate time and money in ways that a lot of born again people never do. But though they are trying so hard to follow Jesus, going from door to door with their briefcases, selling watchtowers, trying to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and, and earn a place in His kingdom, they don't have everlasting life. And when you say to these disciples... You need to believe on Jesus Christ. And if you'll just believe one time in His death and burial and resurrection, you can have everlasting life. They're offended by that suggestion and murmur against you. And they're good people. Many of them are, as, as, as people go, they're good people. And they're working harder for Jesus than some people sitting right here in this room tonight. But they've never believed on him. My, my question to you tonight is, has the Father given you understanding of this truth? That the only way to live forever is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The bread that God sent down from heaven that you'll never, never, never be saved by a lifetime of discipleship or good works. But only by believing on Him. It frightens me to talk to members of, of, of Baptist churches. Are you saved? I'm trying. Going to heaven when you die? I'm doing the best I can. It's the same mindset as the dear lady taking Mass again and again and again and again. You'll never 
earn eternal life by your works. But you'll get it if one time in your life you'll receive the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true bread that came down from heaven. Now, one, one more, let's take one more run at this. Jesus sat in the upper room and he said, this is my body. I want you to eat this. And nobody took a chunk out of his arm. They ate a piece of bread that he handed them. Correct? He said, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. Drink ye all of it. And there was no vampire stuff going on in that room. They drank what was in that cup and his blood continued to flow in his veins. Now, how you could read that and then invent a religion where people line up and believe they're eating the body of Jesus and drinking the blood of Jesus, it just shows what happens when people have a religion but not a Bible. You're not going to get saved eating the bread at a communion table. And you're not going to get saved drinking of the cup at a communion table. You're going to be saved by believing that the Son of God came into the world and died for your sins and rose from the dead. And if you'll believe on Him one time, you'll never need anything else to satisfy the hunger in your soul. He gives life unto the world. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness. They're dead. But if you'll eat me, you'll never die. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He's the bread of God. He's the true bread sent down from heaven. What a meal. You imagine eating one time, never getting hungry again. That'd be amazing. Can't happen with the body. Can't happen with the soul. Thanks be to God. Father, I pray tonight that you give understanding to each and every one that's come this way. This is, this is no doubt as confusing and difficult a topic as there is in all the Bible. And we know that by how many millions of people around the world misunderstand. I pray, Father, that everyone who's heard these words tonight would understand that you don't need to feed them continually to sustain their physical life, but that you desire that one time they receive your Son, the Lord Jesus And having done that, you will sustain the life of their soul forever and forever and forever. I pray, God, that everyone here tonight would truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen.